Hey everyone, I'm continuing on with the Holy Spirit teaching series I've been doing related to dissertation on play and liberation. Obviously, in the last two and a half weeks or so, we've all been processing, engaging, protesting, praying, being alternative community around what's happened in the States with the murder of George Floyd. And so that's obviously been a major focus. Um, so I'm trying to pick back up with some of the teaching videos I was doing before that. I want to talk about lament some more, and this actually is also in the dissertation, and I talked a little bit about it on Sunday here at Pilgrim Church in the teaching time. I'm going to go back through that a little bit and then talk more specifically about lament and speaking in tongues and the connection between the two. So I think, first of all, understanding lament. Lament is this idea of entering into and naming in different ways pain, loss, um, sin, brokenness, both individually and socially, even sometimes socially where we as individuals may not directly have experienced that pain, but often we can enter into lament in solidarity or identification with sins of a nation, sins of a people, um, sins within a family group, and so forth. Romans 8, 26 is sort of a key text that I want us to zoom in on, on lament in the New Testament, and particularly the Holy Spirit in that process of lamenting. It says this, in the same way, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how we should pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with inexpressible groanings. So lament in this text is something that the Spirit can do through us if we allow that or participate in that. Not only the Spirit in creation, but also the Spirit within us, the Holy Spirit indwelling within us. Lament, I believe, it can be understood as a gateway to personal and social liberation from the powers of sin and the lies of the empire around us, the controlling powers around us, the powers of the world that are both used by God, Romans 13, but also under the influence and control of the adversary, 1 John 5, 19. Participating in this yearning for the judgment and justice of God is part of what lament is, is yearning for a justice and judgment that is not yet manifest. And so we enter into that with lament, um, acts of repentance and naming pain is part of what lament is woven up with as well. Lament uh, is part of the repentance process in naming and letting our hearts be softened and convicted and actually entering into awareness of guilt, uh, both personally and socially together. Lament is a part of the repentance process. Um, it's part of that turning, that finding a new direction. It's, it's letting our hearts and our, be broken both in terms of, uh, so letting our hearts be broken in terms of our own uh, sinfulness and our own awareness of what's going on socially as well. Um, Vladimir Lossky, a, an Orthodox theologian, writes this about lament, particularly in light of the Romans 8, 26 and 27 verses. These charismatic tears, he says, which are the consummation of repentance, are at the same time the first fruits of infinite joy. So interestingly, we see lament and breaking into joy tied together. We read this in the Psalms as well, Psalm 30, that rejoicing uh, or weeping remains for the night, but rejoicing comes for the morning. That there's something about letting ourselves be pushed to that place of being on the line, which is also called liminality, being on the line, crossing a threshold with our emotions where we try so hard to control our emotions and we're taught culturally to order our emotions in certain ways. And, there, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that per se, but there are times that scripture calls us to let our emotional guard down to enter into a place where we let our emotions get the better of us, but doing that in a context where we have a, an openness to the Holy Spirit, and that when we let our emotions get to that liminal, that on the line, that threshold crossing over place, there's also potentiality there, potentiality there to be filled and, and touched deeply by the Holy Spirit because we've let down our normal emotive guard and boundaries before God and before ourselves and lament full orbed embracing that in our bodies and our minds and letting it affect our expression can actually open us to new encounters of God and empowerment of the Holy Spirit that leads us out of the place of lament 
empowered with a sense of liberation to face down the injustices in our world, to face and enter into those hard conversations and questions and in extreme cases even be willing to um, lay down our life for the cause of justice and right. Uh, so for an adult fully entering the pain, an empathetic reaction to others' pain can also become a type of what I would call dark play versus normal play, where we talk about getting caught up in the joy and art and beauty and sport and all of that and music. There's this dark play of lament where we let our hearts become broken and aware of our own sinfulness and the sinfulness of our world. And in that weeping, God does something. Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. And in that case, uh, his prophetic speech and the demonstration of the brokenness, um, God uses that and empowers that by his Holy Spirit. Um, so when our empires around us refuse, in extreme cases, refuse to even let us name injustice, I think of like the communist regime that has to censor all the language. Lament can be a form of communication that doesn't have cognitive content, that you can't prosecute crying, as it were, um, that there's this naming of injustice through weeping without using words, non-cognitive. And here we see the connection between lament and the emotional uh, work of lament and also tongue speech, this non-cognitive use of language that actually denounces and exposes empire. Again, um, it's a, uh, I like how one person write it, put it above all people who go through the school of anxiety, robbed as they are of civil and religious certainties, which can function as idols, uh, seem to be able to arrive at an experience of God through lament, through this school of anxiety and naming these things and letting ourselves go there emotionally and mentally. Um, short of just destroying the individual, uh, the groaning of lament expresses the depth of injustice without providing, and I think this is Bruggeri and Walter Brueggemann, without providing prosecutable content for the unjust justice of the oppressor or the persecutor or the empire that you can express without providing content that's prosecutable with cognitive naming of things, even in weeping, that weeping has that kind of power, uh, expressive anguish. Um, silence also can be part of protest. Silence that's demanded can be claimed by the oppressed and then turned into silence of revolt against the imperial speech, the controlling power speech that are doing the injustice. And um, as another one put it this way, tongue speech or glossolalia and silence are functionally equivalent. Both symbolize a response to the depths of the human spirit, to the reality of God, felt as immediate presence. The difference is they may simply just be sub-dialects. So there is a connection here between a type of silence in the face of oppression, uh, the weeping or lamenting or groaning, and also speaking in tongues, that they're sort of sub-dialects of one another, particularly in the cases of oppression, and that making space for that in your spiritual practices and as a community is super important. I'm thankful that when I became a Christian, I was in a place where people prayed with weeping and joy and all of the expressions in between. And that through that, there was often this sense of empowerment and release and then going back into normal life with a new sense of somebodyness, a new sense of God's um, spirit within his people. So a few other things about groans. Groans, tears, laments, shouts, and tongue speech all function in bringing us the person who participates them into the arena of empowerment and liberation. This is a place of imagination, and when joined with the use of our whole being, it's another way to encounter this play, whether we want to use a quote-unquote dark play or just the normal modes of play, that it engages all of us, causing our alignment of our bodies and our imagination to see things differently. Weeping can open us up to the spirit spilling again, or a fresh filling, and also joy can come out of that as a gift, just sheer grace. In spite of all the other circumstances, one can receive joy when one also engages with the lament and weeping over one's sins and the sins and the destruction in the larger society around us. Psalm 30 verse 5 again. His anger lasts for a second, but his favor lasts for a lifetime. Weeping may stay all night, but in the morning, joy. So again... What happens in this sense of play, of the dark play of weeping, is empowerment. And that these prayers um, uh, enable us to enter in and to enter into solidarity with others and allyship with others. That even 
even if we have not personally experienced oppression, we have a role to enter into common lament. I mean, these are not to be confused with sort of the, the meme of sort of the Karen white woman crying to use manipulating others. This is not about, this is totally different from that. That is um, obviously a, a racist racial tactic, uh, privilege tactic. We're talking about identifying and letting God move in our hearts on the injustice of others uh, who are experiencing that. And so lament and weeping are doorways into the Holy Spirit empowerment and can I help us um, be motivated and filled again to engage with the work around justice and Jesus. All right, that's enough for today. God bless.